In the last several modules, we had been looking at the time domain approach to time series analysis. In the time domain approach, a time series x t is explained in terms of its own past values or in terms of the current and past values of the innovations. However, there are is a different approach to time series analysis. This is the frequency domain approach. In the frequency domain approach, a time series is looked upon as composed of several sinusoidal curves of different frequencies. What we will be doing today would be look at the frequency domain approach. The main tool in frequency domain approach is the spectral density function and we will be looking at the spectral density function and its relation to the autocorrelation function. Now, a simple representation of a time series in the frequency domain would be x t is equal to a cos lambda t plus phi plus e t. Now, this lambda is generally referred to as angular frequency, but we will generally be looking at lambda by twice pi which, which we will call as the frequency. A is the amplitude and generally twice pi by lambda is referred to as the period phi is the phase angle and u t is a stationary component. So, you can see that in this case we are trying to represent the time series in terms of a sinusoidal curve and some random component. What later on we will see is that we will not have such simple time series. In most cases a time series would be composed of a number of such sinusoidal curves and we will take a linear combination of those curves to represent the series. Now, before we come to that, let us look at what the frequency domain approach does. So, it is primarily based on the frequency lambda. So, the problem is to identify this lambda. The idea is that the series has some underlying latent sinusoidal curves of different frequencies whose combination gives rise to the irregularities in the series. So, if you have nice sinusoidal curves, they should be giving you regular series. Primarily, it might become even deterministic, but what happens if you have a combination of these curves along with some randomness and you get a resultant time series. And then the problem becomes to look at the series and identify the underlying curves, that is identify the frequencies that gives rise to this underlying curves. Now, to do that, the major tool that we use is referred to as the spectral distribution and the spectral density function. Now, given a distribution function g omega, where omega belongs to the range minus pi to pi, consider the autocorrelation function rho h as a characteristic function. So, in this case, rho h can be written as integral from minus pi to pi e to the power of i omega h d g omega. We are talking in terms of the Lebesgue integral. Now, with rho h is equal to gamma h by gamma naught and the distribution function f omega such that d of omega is equal to gamma naught g omega. We can also write this in terms of gamma h as integral from minus pi to pi e to the power of i omega h d f sub. So, you can write either in terms of rho h or in terms of gamma h. Rho h relates to g omega and gamma h relates to f omega. g omega and f omega are generally called the spectral distribution function or sometimes as the integrated spectrum. So, we call them synonymously depending on whichever of the two functions we are looking at. Let us state a result here. Now, if gamma h is absolutely summable, by absolutely summability it means that summation gamma h absolutely is finite, that is it is absolutely convergent. In that case, d f omega can be written as small f omega g omega, where small f omega is a density function. And 
in that case again gamma h can be written as minus pi q pi e to the power of i omega h f omega into d omega. So, this is the usual thing that we always do in statistics instead of the distribution function we can use the density function if you have a absolutely continuous distribution. We will call this equation 3 and f omega as defined in equation 3 is referred to as the spectral density function or very often it is also called the spectrum. Now, let us look at the existence of the spectral density function. To do that we will state a result. If for a stationary time series gamma h is absolutely summable, then there exists a continuous function f omega such that gamma h is equal to minus pi to pi f omega cos omega h d omega. f omega is non-negative and f omega integrates between minus pi to pi to be equal to 1. So, in this case we can say that for absolutely summable gamma h there is always a continuous function which would act as a spectral density function and that function would be given by omega h is equal to minus pi to pi f omega cos omega h d omega. And additionally what happens is that f omega is an even function that means f minus omega would be equal to f omega. Now, a real valued function f omega defined on minus pi to pi is the spectral density function of a stationary process if and only if it satisfies the three conditions that um, f omega is non-negative minus pi to pi f omega d omega is 1 and f omega is an even function. So, in this case what we say is that you have any real valued function which is defined obviously on minus pi to pi. Then we can say that this is a spectral density function provided it satisfies these three conditions. Now, the first two conditions are the general condition for any density function. The additional condition that we require here is the third condition which is that f omega is an even function. On the other hand, if f omega satisfies this three conditions, it is a spectral density function and we have already seen that the spectral density function satisfies these three conditions. So, this is a necessary and sufficient condition. Now, the Fourier transformation actually gives us f omega is equal to 1 by twice pi summation h summing from minus infinity to infinity e to the power of minus i h omega gamma h and this is defined for all omega between minus pi and pi. Now, for a real valued process since gamma h is an even function we can write this as 1 by pi 1 plus twice h is equal to 1 to infinity gamma h cos omega h. Being a real valued process we do not have the imaginary term here and we can write in that case if we take out the value for gamma naught we can write this in terms of the remaining gamma h values as the only the positive h values and you can take twice of that and you can write it in this form. Now, so what is important about this? The importance here is that previously we had been defining gamma h in terms of the spectral density. Now, we are reverting this, we are defining the spectral density in terms of the gamma h. So, let us make a very quick comparison. The autocovariance gamma h or the ACF rho h, either one of these two, this is the basic tool for the time domain approach. On the other hand, the spectral density f omega or g omega, either one of these two is the basic tool for the frequency domain approach. And what we saw from equation 3 and 4, this there is a relationship between the time domain approach and the frequency domain approach. So, 3 actually gives us gamma in terms of f and 4 gives us f in terms of gamma. So, we can go from one to the other very easily. Now, let us look at a very special case. We will look at the simplest of this case, the purely random process. Now, x t is identically and independently distributed 
with expectation of x t equal to 0 and variance of x t equal to sigma square. In that case, we have seen that gamma h is equal to sigma square if h is equal to 0 and is 0 if h is greater than 0. So, it just have one single spike in gamma h and that is at h equal to 0. Now, if you substitute this in the expression 4, then what we find is that since gamma h is equal to 0 for all h greater than 0, the summation terms actually become 0. So, we are only left with the first term and the first term has gamma naught equal to sigma square and hence we have f omega equal to sigma square by pi. If we did the same exercise using rho h, remember that rho h is equal to 1 if h is equal to 0 and is 0 otherwise and use the same sort of relation, we have a similar relation between rho and gamma as we have between rather we have a similar relation between rho and g as we have between gamma and f. So, if we use that relationship, we would get g omega is equal to 1 by pi. So, this is for a purely random process and what we see here is that there is a single spike value. Now, before we end today's talk and we will further look at several examples in the next talk, before we do that, let us look at the interpretation of f omega. What does f omega actually represent? Now, if we look at just omega between 0 and pi, okay, so we are assuming that cutting off the negative values, assuming that there is no frequency in the negative range minus pi to 0, so confine our omega to 0 to pi. This is for simplicity because we can always extend this to the range minus pi to pi. In that case, gamma naught becomes 0 to pi because we are taking h is equal to 0 here. So, the e term actually goes, the exponential term is not here. So, we have b f omega is equal to and that would give us f pi because f naught is going to be 0 and this would account for the total variability of x t. So, what does f pi give you in this case? It gives you the total variability of the process. Now, since f omega is monotonically increasing in 0 pi, f omega can be interpreted as the amount of variability explained by the frequencies 0 to omega. So, what we are saying is that f pi, pi is the right hand limit. Okay. It starts from 0 and f 0 is 0 and from 0 it increases to f pi at pi and it is monotonically increasing. So, if we take any omega somewhere in between, this would give us the area to the left of omega under this curve, which would actually give us f, this would give us the amount of variability explained by the frequency. And as we go along, as omega tends towards pi, we take account of more and more variability of x t and finally, when we reach pi, we explain the total variability and f pi becomes equal to gamma naught. What does it mean in terms of small f omega? Now, small f omega d omega, so we take a very small interval omega to omega plus d omega, then small f omega d omega can be interpreted as the amount of variability explained by the frequencies. So, what we have is, if you look at a density function, this would be the ordinate, f omega would be the ordinate and in this case the ordinate actually gives you the frequency at omega. So, if it was a discrete time series, the omega frequency would have accounted for f omega amount of variability in the data. If you look at g omega now, capital G omega gives the proportion of the variability explained by the frequencies 0 to omega and a small g omega obviously has a same interpretation of relative frequency or relative proportion given that the total now is 1. So, total area under the curve is 1. In general, f omega if you plot this, the area under the curve would be f pi equal to gamma naught that is the whole area and each of these ordinates in that case would be explaining the amount of variability that is being accounted for by that frequency. So, that would be your small f omega. 
And now let us very quickly go back to capital F omega. So, capital F omega primarily is the sum of the small f omegas or small f tau's up to the point omega. So, it is the sum of all the frequencies up to the omega value. Therefore, it will give you the sum of this total variabilities at each of this omega. So, it will give you the total variability up to the point omega. We will look at this later and see how we can explain the variability in the process through the spectral density function. Today, we have been looking at the frequency domain approach to time series analysis. We have defined the main tool that we use in the frequency domain, which is called the spectral density function. And we have also looked at its relationship with the autocovariance function. So, as we can see the time domain approach and the frequency domain approach are basically two sides of the same leaf. So, you can go from one to the other depending on which method you want to employ. In some situations the time domain approach is a better fit and in some situations the frequency domain approach gives you a better understanding of the underlying process. So, you can always go from one to the other. What we will do in the subsequent classes is to see how the processes evolve in terms of the spectral densities and we will also see how we can actually identify and estimate the spectral density function as such.